He's the unsung hero of American rocketry. Jack Parsons was the guiding genius of the American space program in its very earliest days. Founder of NASA's JPL and Aerojet Corporation. Those two things have snowballed into massive industries and rocketry as we know it today. But Jack Parsons' genius has a dark side. This strange private life involving magic and the occult. Did his unusual beliefs and top secret science play a role in his violent end? Was he killed by the American government? Was he killed by the Israeli government? Solving this Cold War case will take modern day science. He was himself as volatile as the chemicals he worked with. June 17, 1952. Pasadena, California is rocked by a massive explosion. A makeshift laboratory lies in ruins, and Jack Parsons, a legend of American science, is mortally wounded. The doors were blown off their hinges, the windows had been completely shattered, and Parsons himself was left uh, slumped under a, a wash tub. His right arm had been blown off, and his two legs were, were broken and shattered and bent in, uh, in awful positions. Jack Parsons dies from his injuries at just 37 years of age. In his short life, he had unlocked some of the greatest scientific mysteries of his time and paved the way for humankind to enter space. Jack's work pretty much was the basis of all rocket science. He helped form the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Since then, it has been really the leading world uh, institution for the exploration of space. The Voyager 1 and 2 probes, which have gone further than any man-made spacecraft, that was the JPL. If you think of the Mars rover, that was the JPL. They used to call the JPL the Jack Parsons Laboratory. He was the moving force. He was the believer. The others pretty much followed his suit. He helped form Aerojet Corporation. The largest rocket facilities in the free world, Aerojet's liquid and solid rocket plants on 18,000 acres near Sacramento. He did come up with composite motors and he did come up with really America's first liquid rocket motor. Those two things have snowballed into massive industries and rocketry as we know it today. Without Parsons, there would be no man on the moon. There'd be no space shuttle. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He was really a transformative figure in American science. But Jack Parsons has a hidden dark side that might be linked to his death. He didn't live in one box. He was not easy to categorize. Passionate, romantic, philosophical, self-serving, narcissistic, ambitious. And he wasn't afraid to be all of those things sort of at the same time. He was an eccentric who bizarrely had had this strange private life involving magic and the occult. Parsons is fascinated by ritual magic and attends nightly meetings of an occult society called Ordo Templi Orientis. He sees magic as a legitimate science, just like rocketry. And he thought that magic was just another form of technology that hadn't really kind of got to the furthest stages yet, that hadn't been studied yet, that would one day become a science. Parson's beliefs turn him into an outsider in the fact-based field of rocketry, earning him many enemies. And though his 1952 death is officially ruled an accident, suspicion lingers. Is it possible that Jack Parsons was murdered? It's very possible. Born in 1914, Jack Parsons grew up in a wealthy Los Angeles family. The seed for his genius was sown by an early love of science fiction. He had read Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, all of the popular sort of science fiction uh, authors of the time. Rocketry hadn't even been coined as a phrase. Nobody really thought that rockets were a serious science. The general consensus among scientists was that it was impossible to leave Earth's gravitational field. 
There was no way you were going to put a rocket into space. Parsons chooses to ignore such conventional wisdom. Long before the space race, he dreams that rockets will one day take mankind to the moon and beyond. Jack Parsons was extremely interested in getting into space. That was his greatest dream. Parsons finished high school, but he never actually made it to college. It wasn't necessary for him to go to college to follow his dream. He was kind of creating the dream as he went along. Jack didn't go to college, per se, but he lived right next to Caltech. The California Institute of Technology attracts the finest science and engineering minds in America. Parsons is a self-taught chemist with no qualifications, but he's invited into Caltech's elite fold by the legendary aerospace engineer, Dr. Theodore von Karman. He realized that if rocketry was going to get started, you needed a flash in the pan, you needed a spark. You needed somebody who was not just your, your usual white-coated scientist. In the 1930s, rocketry is the most difficult science on Earth, a new frontier that combines the greatest challenges of engineering, physics, and chemistry. Parsons and his Caltech pals apply themselves to one of the field's riskiest dilemmas, how to create the sustained controlled explosion needed for a rocket's thrust. These guys would go out and blow things up to see how they could design a fuel that would break out of the Earth's atmosphere. Parsons' crew comes close to death so many times, they become known on campus as the Suicide Squad. Whenever there was a test going on and there was an explosion, you know, the classes would have to be shut down. There'd be noxious gases floating over the campus. The Suicide Squad is forced off campus into an iron shed at Devil Gate Dam in the nearby Arroyo Seco Canyon. They were working without any safety procedures at all. It was real seat of the pants science. By 1938, no one in California knows more about explosive substances than Jack Parsons. And that knowledge, combined with his movie star good looks, is about to catapult Jack Parsons into the limelight. He kind of burst onto the scene in Los Angeles during the trial of Earl Kinnett. Earl Kinnett was a corrupt LA police chief accused of car bombing a fellow officer. At the age of 23, Parsons becomes the key expert for the prosecution in Kinnett's trial for attempted murder. When Parsons testified, he stole the show, and he wowed the courtroom with his talk of how sudden explosives could have caused the damage to this car. The high-profile case gives Parsons his first taste of fame. It also earns him a lifelong enemy, Earl Kinnett, the first of many. Earl Kinnett found himself being thrown into jail on the testimony of a guy who was really just 23 years old. This brainiac from Caltech who had come in and pretty much sealed the deal on the prosecution's case against Earl Kinnett. I don't think that Jack really understood how much of an enemy he had made out of Earl Kinnett or how powerful Kinnett really was with both within the LAPD and in the city of LA itself. The crooked cop Kinnett gets 10 years in San Quentin prison. With revenge on his mind, could Kinnett have been responsible for the explosion that killed Jack Parsons. He was released only a few weeks before Jack Parsons' death. If I were working this case, former LAPD officer Kenyette would probably be my prime suspect. He very well could have placed an explosive under the floor in the apartment where Jack was working. But there are others with a motive to kill Jack Parsons. And homicide is only one of the theories of his death. On that fatal afternoon, Jack Parsons had been working in his makeshift home laboratory. One theory is he deliberately blew himself up. Another possibility, suggested by LAPD investigators, is that he dropped a volatile chemical by accident. Quite possibly, LAPD did not have the facilities or the expertise to investigate an explosion scene of that nature. It's quite possible they just didn't know what they were doing. If an incident like Jack Parsons' death happened today, the FBI would send in a team called a post-blast investigation team, and they would be able to recreate the explosion and say exactly how it happened. Now, such 21st century science can be applied to the case for the first time. Tom Thurman 
is a former FBI explosives expert who's reconstructed hundreds of blasts, including the 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie. He'll be using the same techniques to crack this 65-year-old mystery. The three main scenarios that we'll be testing are the assassination theory, the accident theory, and the suicide theory. Thurman has built a replica of Jack Parsons' home laboratory and will attempt to recreate the blast that killed him. By recreating a explosion scene, it allows you to examine that scene just as you would have been at the original scene. By looking at the photos that were taken post-explosion, the scene is literally devastation. You have one wall that is partially blown out. You have a wall with some windows, looks like, that is bowing out. You have a lot of fragmentation of wood, debris that is all over the floor. Reading the police reports, Thurman notices something that doesn't add up. The police in this investigation theorized that mercury fulminate was the explosive that detonated. I find that hard to, to believe. Mercury fulminate is a highly volatile chemical. It's incredibly sensitive to heat, friction, or shock. Any agitation makes it blow up, decomposing violently into nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and mercury. It's unlikely that Jack Parsons was working with mercury fulminate because it is just too sensitive. I know of no actual commercial purpose in that period of time for mercury fulminate. Police had based their theory on traces of mercury found in the destroyed lab, but Thurman thinks the mercury could have come from a different source. Jack Parsons had a number of mercury thermometers in that room. The explosion fragmented these mercury thermometers, and they jumped to the conclusion that it was mercury fulminate as the explosive. Instead of mercury fulminate, Thurman believes it's far more likely that Parsons was working with nitroglycerin. So he'll be testing with nitroglycerin solid form, dynamite, which would also be the preferred explosive for an assassination. But before blowing up Parsons' mock lab, he has to figure out how much dynamite to use. By looking at the photos that were taken post-explosion, I'm estimating that that hole is two feet by two feet. This tin can holds two pounds of dynamite. Five, four, three, two, one. Five, four, three, two, one. With a test blast using two pounds of dynamite, explosives expert Tom Thurman has replicated the force of the blast that killed American rocketry pioneer Jack Parsons. Hey, hey look at this. Okay, Guys, this looks just like the picture. To investigate exactly how Parsons died, Thurman will next rig a rebuilt lab with the same amount of dynamite. But solving the mystery of Parsons' death also means digging deep into his scientific career to find out who had a motive to kill him. His life was uh, so filled with a mystery, with weirdness, with odd people, with strange connections, that we can't be certain whether it was an accident or whether it was something more sinister. In the 1930s and 40s, Jack Parsons is leading the charge towards a distant dream of space travel, a charge that will make him friends and enemies. His crew of risk-taking rocket pioneers are dubbed the Suicide Squad. The Suicide Squad, that was the core group of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This started it, and they followed Jack Parsons because Parsons was the visionary. Parsons was the guy that said, yeah, we can do this. There were virtually no one else in the United States doing this because they had been told it was impossible. Rocketry is still considered a fringe science, but in 1938, 
With World War II on the horizon, that's about to change. The Germans are developing all sorts of secret weapons. But we don't know how they're doing it. We don't know what the science is. We certainly don't know what the engineering is. America's military leaders want to match Germany's rocket capability and are soon knocking on Jack Parsons' door. The US Army said, what can you guys do? And this was a bunch of kids, basically. These were late teens, 20-somethings. Jack and his suicide squad receive a $1,000 military grant, becoming the first government-funded rocketry research group in history. The first $250 goes to repairing damage they've caused at Caltech. The rest they use to develop a revolutionary upgrade for military aircraft, Jet Assisted Takeoff, or JADO. These rockets would be strapped under the wings of planes, and this would give them that extra boost to get off the short runways, to get off the aircraft carrier while they were laden with bombs. In August 1941, JADO rockets successfully reduced the takeoff distance of a test flight by 50%. After JADO, we could take a fully laden bomber that's fully loaded with fuel and put it into a really small runway. It allowed us to take off from places that we could not take off before. It was an absolute necessity for war fighting. Next, Parsons sets out to solve an inherent problem with existing rocket fuel. The rockets were either fueled by liquid propellant uh, or by uh, solid powder, kind of gunpowder. And both fuels had their problems. They would explode while they were being carried or transported, and generally they were very volatile and, and unpredictable. In his search for a more stable alternative, Parsons draws inspiration from a 1,500-year-old legend of a terrifying weapon known as Greek fire. Byzantine sailors fired the burning substance at enemy ships. Although its composition is a mystery, Parsons believes Greek fire was likely a version of asphalt. In 1942, he begins experimenting with an asphalt-based fuel, codenamed Gausset 53. Asphalt does not immediately jump to mind as a great rocket fuel. These things seem to come out of thin air, but in fact, it's due to his innate understanding of the chemical processes. It would be both a solid and a liquid at the same time. It would be uh, not as dangerous as the liquid. It would be more reliable than the solid. Parsons' previously classified research reports show that the game-changing new fuel could be stored indefinitely, was far quicker to load into the rocket unit, and was much safer to handle. This innovation by Parsons really changed history. Parsons' innovation had two impacts. Number one, Rocket motors were storable over a long period of time. And number two, they could be made much larger and much more powerful. The jet age was beginning. By the end of 1942, the rocketry business is booming. The Navy is ordering 20,000 JADOs a month from Parsons Manufacturing Group, now trading commercially as Aerojet. Within a few years, it was a multi-million dollar business. Meanwhile, Parsons' research operation becomes the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, with a $3 million military grant to develop rocket-based weapons for the war. In a few short years, Jack Parsons has gone from a self-taught chemist setting off explosions in the desert to heading up major military technology companies that would power some of the most effective missiles in American history. Motors for the Polaris missile, for the Genie, the single chamber dual thrust Hawk motor, the Gar 9, Scout, and many others. But as his status as a rocket scientist grows, strangely, so too does his interest in ritual magic. Parsons is now head of the Californian chapter of the Ordo Templi Orientis and makes no secret of his unusual beliefs at the office. He thought that his role was not only in science, but it was also in religion. But the military man and scientists in the rocketry industry don't understand Parsons' obsession with magic rituals and the occult. Parsons was seen as a liability, both by rocket science and by rocket business. He just wasn't a company man. 
He doesn't believe in towing the line. When people realized that he was interested in metaphysical beings from another world, in occult rituals, they really started to think, no matter what his brilliance was in rocketry, they didn't want him working with them. In December 1944, under pressure from colleagues, Parsons agrees to part ways with Aerojet. He resigns from his position as project engineer, sells his shares for $11,000, and walks away from the company he helped build from scratch. Parsons has suddenly been exiled from the very science which he had helped found. And as an exile, Jack Parsons will begin walking on dangerous ground. Strange rituals involving sex and drugs were taking place. What happened here? Was it an accident? Did somebody try to kill him? Iconic American rocket scientist Jack Parsons had an accomplished and colorful career that ended in a violent death, shrouded in mystery. June 17th, 1952 was a kind of constellation of events that were very, very suspicious, that were suspicious then and which remain suspicious today. Now, former FBI post-blast investigator Tom Thurman is using modern-day forensic techniques to find answers about what happened that fateful day. Thurman's initial test has established that the force of the blast that killed Parsons was equivalent to two pounds of dynamite. We've got about a two-foot hole. Unbelievable how our hole up there does look just like this one. On an explosives range, Thurman has built a replica similar in size and layout to Parsons' lab, complete with the workbench he was mixing chemicals on, the metal coffee can where police claimed the explosion originated, and a mannequin in the same place that Parsons was estimated to have been standing right before he died. It's very interesting to go back and relook at this and see in today's world with what we know about explosives, what happened here? Was it an accident? Did somebody try to kill him? There are many who may have wanted to. After leaving Aerojet in 1944, Jack Parsons moves in strange circles and makes powerful enemies. If Jack Parsons was murdered, there are a number of possible perpetrators of the crime. There is a laundry list. Parsons uses the proceeds of his Aerojet shares to buy a lease on a mansion on Pasadena's Millionaire's Row. His lifestyle is extravagant and extraordinary. He lived in a large house in Pasadena, which served as kind of a meeting place for science fiction writers and occultists and all sorts of sort of counterculture people at the time. He had all this great money. He had this big house that he turned into kind of a commune. The Parsonage, as it's known, becomes a magnet for all manner of eccentrics, a haven for drugs, alcohol, and sexual freedom. There's all sorts of things taking place at the house in Pasadena. People running around half naked in robes, doing all sorts of crazy rituals. One visitor at the Parsonage is a little known science fiction author, a man who would become famous as the founder of Scientology. Parsons met L. Ron Hubbard in 1946 through a friend, and they struck up a very fast friendship. Hubbard quickly became Parsons' best friend, his magical assistant, and they shared pretty much everything with one another. Not only in magical work, but in finances. Hubbard convinces Parsons to set up a joint corporation called Allied Corporation, and he takes Parsons' money. The two of them had been best friends until Hubbard had betrayed Parsons, had stolen $20,000 of his money, and had run off with his girlfriend at the time. So although the two had been very close, Hubbard really uh, was another blow against Parsons' self-esteem. But Parsons doesn't give up on his ambitions. In 1946, he has top-level security clearance as he works with North American Aviation on the SM-64 Navajo Missile Project a top secret Air Force project to develop a supersonic intercontinental ballistic missile that would be able to be fired from the United States and reach the Soviet Union carrying a nuclear payload. 
across America, communism has emerged as a new threat to freedom. This is the Cold War. The idea that there were communist spies lurking under every bed in America. May Day brings a wave of anti-communist sentiment as 100,000 march down New York Fifth Avenue in a loyalty parade. The House Un-American Activities Committee was looking very closely at any scientist that could have left-leaning, possibly communist beliefs. The freedom is being challenged throughout the world today by the forces of imperialistic communism. If you were involved in uh, space science, rocket science, uh, developing munitions of any kind, you were especially considered to be dangerous. The constant flow of strange visitors and rituals at his home, the Parsonage, puts Jack on the radar of the FBI. They had received word that a strange cult was operating out of his home in Pasadena. Not only that, Parsons is rumored to have associations with communists. For somebody working on a top secret nuclear program, that was just not something that the United States was going to let fly. Suddenly, the witch hunt was on. They began to conduct surveillance and infiltrate the organization. They realized that strange rituals involving sex and drugs were taking place at this location. The FBI names Parsons as a subversive character. And in September 1948, he's stripped of his top secret security clearance. He was declared by the Industrial Employment Review Board as undesirable for employment in national defense work. You can't work on military contracts for the government without a top secret security clearance. So losing that clearance would virtually put him out of his life's work. Parsons is sacked from his job at North American Aviation and is forced to just do whatever he can to survive. He pumps gas, he mends cars. Uh, this genius rocket scientist is reduced to kind of really scratching by. He was now on the outside looking in. People couldn't talk to Jack Parsons because he lost his security clearance. His friends were in danger of losing theirs. So he becomes a kind of pariah. Facing financial ruin, Jack Parsons will be offered a lifeline by one of the richest men in the world, Howard Hughes. He was rich, he was powerful, and he was vengeful. One suggestion has been that Howard Hughes might have wanted Parsons dead. In 1949, troubled genius Jack Parsons finds himself on the outskirts of the industry he created, after the FBI strips him of his top secret security clearance. His reputation now is as some kind of weird, eccentric, a devil-worshipping rocket scientist. So where is he going to get a job after that? It's virtually impossible. Without his security clearance, Parsons is useless. Unable to work on any U.S. military or space-related projects, Parsons considers leaving America and taking 15 years of rocketry expertise with him. Jack Parsons was a walking, classified vault of information as to how rockets were developed, rocket fuel was developed. He had it all in his head, everything. He could go anywhere and start up from scratch in any country on, on the planet. Could we allow that to fall into enemy hands? Parsons seeks work in the soon-to-be-declared state of Israel. Although he had lost his security clearance in the US, Israel would be more than happy to give him a security clearance to work with them and their scientists in Israel to develop a defensive capability. As a last resort before leaving the country, Parsons calls on some friends at Caltech. And with their help in March 1949, he successfully reapplies for his U.S. security clearance. After Parsons' security clearance was reinstated, he was able to get a job at Hughes Aircraft. Billionaire businessman Howard Hughes is setting up the Hughes Aerospace Group. He takes a chance on a desperate Jack Parsons. At Hughes, they contracted him in order to write up a proposal for a chemical plant to be used in their own rocket program. At the same time, Parsons is still in discussions with the Israelis. They ask him to send a similar proposal for their planned rocket program. Parsons had to prove that he could bring rockets to Israel, that he could not only build them, but he could run a whole rocketry concern there. 
it makes sense to Parsons to use some of the work he's already done at Hughes to prepare the Israeli document. What he did was he took the papers that he authored at Hughes and had them typed up by a secretary. Jack was essentially turning American state secrets over to an organ of the Israeli government for development of the Israeli rocket program. He was using documents which were top secret for the Americans and then giving them to the Israelis. Any normal person would have realized that this was a problem. The secretary soon realizes she's being asked to copy classified documents. When she saw the papers that he was asking her to type up, was immediately aware of their importance and went to Hughes security and told them that Parsons was possibly committing espionage. A furious Howard Hughes reports Jack Parsons to the FBI as an Israeli spy. Parsons' only defense really is that, well, he made a mistake. He didn't realize it was such a bad thing. And one can believe him. He wasn't really the sort of character who would get involved with espionage. I really don't believe that he believed that he was doing anything wrong. But Howard Hughes and the US government don't see it that way. He's immediately investigated by the FBI once more. And this time, he's not getting his security clearance back. It's the final strike against Jack Parsons and another mortal enemy is added to the list. Some people believe uh, that Howard Hughes was so angry at what Parsons had done, leaking top secrets to the Israelis, that he had planned Parsons' assassination. But a vengeful billionaire is not the only one with Jack Parsons in his sights. Branded a spy and officially unemployable in the US, the father of modern rocketry is now a loose cannon loaded with national secrets. In that era of the Cold War, there was a delicate balance of power existing in the world. And anything that could tip that balance one way or another um, could alter world history. And Jack Parsons' knowledge and expertise was just the thing that could tip that kind of balance. The government did not know how to handle this. You could classify documents, but how do you classify what's in Jack Parsons' head? Since you couldn't stop him from giving this information to someone else, you would have to stop Jack Parsons, period. There's a lot of conflicting ideas about Jack's death. It rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Either Israel wanted him dead, the United States wanted Jack Parsons dead, or there was a kind of mutual uh, understanding that it's better for everybody if Jack Parsons was dead. In the last months of his life, Jack Parsons' career hits rock bottom. Branded a traitor and a spy, he'll never work as a rocket scientist in America again. This ruins his career professionally, but also personally, it's a devastating blow. But he still needs to live and he needs to get a job, but the only place he can actually work is working at a local explosives company, uh, making special effects for Hollywood films. Uh, this was a significant come down uh, for the father of uh, modern rocketry. His lavish lifestyle is long gone, and so is his magical mansion. He was destitute. He'd moved in, into a little garage down the street from his original house on Orange Grove. He needs to get out. He needs to go somewhere where he would be appreciated, where he could actually go back to work in his chosen profession. And his only hope would be to leave the country. Parsons makes plans to go to Mexico, but it's not clear what he intends to do there. Mexico City was now a hotbed of spies for pro-Nazi elements, pro-Soviet elements, and of course for Latin American movements. So you have a situation that was very volatile for Parsons to suddenly appear in the midst of all of that. He would have been a target that was irresistible for these groups. Parsons was just about to leave for Mexico. If you were out to get him, now would be the time to do it. The US government would not have wanted Parsons to leave, and there was no legal way to stop him from doing that at this point. There was only the illegal way of making sure he would not leave the country alive. As this police photo shows, on June 17th, Jack Parsons is packed and ready to leave the United States. 
So everything is set up. They're loading the car. They're going to drive down. They're ready to leave that day. He had received a call from the chemical company that he was working for that they had a last minute order for a load of pyrotechnics. Some theorized the call was a trick designed to delay Parsons' departure to Mexico long enough for his enemies to strike. There were a lot of explosives already there. It was the ideal place. If you wanted to get rid of Jack Parsons, that was the place to do it. Parsons is rushing to finish the work before he leaves. He's mixing chemicals in his home laboratory, where he also keeps explosive supplies. Parsons had open vials of chemicals everywhere. He was known to have barrels of open gunpowder on his back porch. He had all this stuff just laying out. It's an accident waiting to happen, but also the perfect setting for a secret assassination. From what we can make out of it, he was working in a very slapdash way, mixing a very explosive chemical in an old coffee can, and this desperately trying to get this ready before he left. But did he really drop that coffee can by accident? causing an explosion? Or did the explosion come from a hidden source? 65 years later, Tom Thurman has recreated Parsons' lab in an effort to find out. To replicate the original 1952 explosion, he'll detonate two pounds of dynamite in a coffee can on the floor. Will it cause similar damage to the lab and to the mannequin standing in for Jack Parsons? Charging, charged, here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. In 1952, famed American rocket engineer Jack Parsons lies in the rubble of his exploded laboratory. His legs have been, if not blasted off, they've been smashed basically to smithereens. Within minutes, the godfather of American rocketry is dead. But is his death an accident, suicide, or assassination? Post-blast investigator Tom Thurman has set off a similar-sized explosion in a replica of Parsons' lab. His goal is to see if the damage fits the original LAPD conclusion that Parsons' death was an accident. Look at this hole. Look at our hole here. Joist right here, exactly. And the size of it, it it's exactly what we've got here. It's basically two by two feet. The damage to the mannequin also matches Parsons' injuries almost exactly. Oh, wow, well, look at the leg. Right leg, just as he was positioned right beside the hole. We've got arm, his right arm, off. His leg, I'm going to pull it out. Shattered. And look at the fragmentation holes in here. From the coffee can, Massive check the pants. damage. Remember in the reports on how his legs were broken in many, many places? This is exactly what would happen and what it would look like. I think the leg and the pants tell the story. The damage shows the blast did originate from floor level. But what caused the explosion? Some believe Parsons was at rock bottom in his career and deliberately blew himself up. The theory? Jack Parsons wanted to commit suicide. He had an explosive, dropped it on the floor, and it detonated, ultimately killing him. I find that very, very unlikely. From what I've seen in the explosion, there would be other ways to absolutely ensure that he was killed instantly. I believe that Jack Parsons knew more about explosives than using this to, to kill himself. Another theory suggests that with so many enemies and as the keeper of dangerous knowledge, Jack Parsons was assassinated by a bomb planted underneath the floor. Was he killed by the American government? 
Was he killed by Earl Kinnett? Was he killed by the Israeli government? Scrutiny of the original scene photos and the replicated blast site indicate the answer was no. The scene does not tell me that the explosion came from under the floor. It tells me that the explosion came on top of the floor. Looking at this photograph, it's evident to me that the explosion was on the floor and punched down through the floor. We've done the same thing here, where we've got pieces of the floor that's pointing down and toward the crater. And we've replicated this crater here that's in the photograph. It's almost a perfect match. I agree. It was not a suicide. It was not an assassination. It was an accident. And our tests have proved it. Tom Thurman now believes Jack Parsons made a simple but deadly mistake. It's my opinion that Jack Parsons had nitroglycerin on the workbench and accidentally knocked it off. When it hit the floor, it detonated. In my mind, case solved, it's an accident. But not everyone is convinced. There's every chance Jack Parsons was murdered in a way that would make it appear accidental. Well, there's a lot of avenues that have not been totally explored because the documents are still held uh, as classified or they just simply haven't been released. So I think there's more coming and I think we will know more about Jack Parsons. And I think that's going to lead us to understand that perhaps Parsons was assassinated to keep him from leaving the United States. Jack Parsons is remembered today as a flawed genius. This is why we still think about him, because he was himself as volatile as the chemicals he worked with. A man who tried to walk in two worlds, magic and science, and ended up with a place in neither. Because of his kind of eccentric private life, uh, nobody wants to admit that the space program in the United States all depends on this crazy, eccentric occultist. Jack Parsons died before his lifelong dream of space travel became a reality. But in 1972, he was immortalized when a lunar crater was named after him. Appropriately, it's on the dark side of the moon.